In the early 1970s, I warned against accepting wholesale advice from experts like me. Uh, experts really have a, a rather quirky vision, and I compared it at that time to a story by Robert Bentley, and I, I think Robert Bentley is still remembered, uh, who wrote a story called A Trip Through a Fish Cannery from the Viewpoint of a Sardine. And that's the way I, I regard critics, myself included. Now, to support that, I told a very true and quite poignant story. I grew up in San Diego, and there was a, a, a writer of Western stories who moved to San Diego at the time I was growing up. Now, he was a genuine bow-legged cowboy who'd begun to write stories with a stub pencil in the bunkhouse. Now, he couldn't spell, but the stories were so good that the publishers found someone to put in a little spelling, and they published him, and he became quite a successful writer of Western stories, moved to San Diego, and joined a professional, professional group of, of writers called the Padres. I think they were probably Los Padres, but being Southern California, I'm sure it was the Padres. This was before the, the baseball team. Now, there he began to hear fellow writers talk about uh, denouement, uh, protagonists, antagonists, rising action. These are terms he'd never heard out on the ring. Uh, <laughs> Embarrassed by his ignorance, he got an armload of books on fiction techniques and, and writer's advice and so forth, and vanished for some months. Finally emerged triumphant. Now he knew what he was doing. He'd be able to write like a pro. And I needn't tell you, from that moment on, he couldn't sell another story. It took about a year until he rendered or unlearned all of this academic book learning and began publishing again. True story. Okay. In 1975, I talked about the characters in our books who get no respect, the villains. And I pointed out uh, this equation, the stronger the villain, the stronger the hero or heroine, the stronger the story. Treasure Island would be a forgotten novel if it weren't for the character of Long John Silver. Oliver Twist would be a wimpy novel without Fagin. You had it forgotten as well, as well. So for the fiction writer, I said, uh, the villain can be your best friend. And let me just add on a personal note, a couple of my villains have been so good to me, I'm naming them in my will. <laughs> now, I got an early reality check. This goes way back. I was writing short stories in Midway Along, and I'm sure this happened to all of you. I decided to change my heroine's na a character's name. I, the heroine had started out as Phyllis, and for some reason, I did, decided I didn't want to call Phyllis, I wanted to call Flo. I can't imagine why. Then I forgot to go back and make the changes. The story was published intact this way. Now that was bad enough, but even more disturbing was that nobody noticed. <laughs> this Phyllis had somehow mysteriously morphed into Flo. And I heard a voice from above say, Sid, put away the hammer and chisel. Forget that stone of marble. Just keep your hat size. Uh, this, I, 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 uh, the next year, as a matter of fact, I talk about the writer's need for perseverance. This has come up at this conference. You must have perseverance. And really kind of a cockeyed cock optimism to survive as a writer. Now, uh, this, was a, this was told to me by the person at dinner one night. His name is Eddie Orkin. Eddie Orkut used to write short stories for the Saturday Evening Post, Colliers, and all of the, the slick magazines of, the, of, the, of that day. He was a superb stylist and a good storyteller. But as sometimes happened, things go sour. He was with Brandon Brandt, the, the, the agency. Is Brandon Brandt still in business? Okay. He was with Brandon Brandt. For almost a year, suddenly, they could not sell an Eddie Orkut story. And he became low on money and became depressed. And late one morning, he closed the windows, turned on the gas, lay on the couch, and decided to contemplate eternity without rejection slips. Now he's lying there, and he hears the mail arrive. Flip, flip. <laughs> like an old war horse or any writer, of course, the mail is our umbilical cord. He bestirred himself and got up to see what the mail was. And there was a letter from Brant and Brant. They had just sold two stories to the Saturday Post, 
and one to the American magazine. He promptly turned off the gas, opened the windows, and lived to a fairly ripe old age. <laughs> At the end of the 70s, I cited Maxim Gorky, the Russian novelist, who said in seven words what we make a speech out of. Uh, asked how to write for children, this was his reply. He said, the same as for adults, only better. Uh, when you write a story, and I don't care who you are, there are going to be holes in your story. And sometimes, logically, you cannot plug the hole. But there is a way to do it. And as I pointed out, the way you do it is you point out the hole to the reader, and magically, the, the hole will disappear. I cited several examples, the one I'll give you. I've been reading a novel in which a boy, able to drive a teenager, he sees a crime being committed. He jumps in his car, and he chases the villains down a country road for half the book. Meanwhile, you're thinking, why didn't that idiot stop and call the police? Which was a lot of things. Well, had he stopped and called the police, the author would not have had a novel. <laughs> so finally, the author cured the problem. And he has the character pause for breath and declare with sweet innocence, this line, I don't know why I didn't stop and call the police. <laughs> Abracadabra, it plugged the hole. <laughs> My best wishes to you all. Thank you very much.